the DOJ in this case. We really want to expose that fact. But first of all, I want to, I'll speak in just a moment, but I'd like to open this up with our two lawyers, Bruce Alperin and Carl Mayer, and then we've got a lineup for you of the plaintiffs and other people who have supported us from day one. So, starting out with Bruce Alperin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you're free to ask any questions. Let me make a statement first, I suppose. Can you all hear me? Speak louder! Shout! All right, I will speak. Give me a moment then. Where's your microphone? Yeah, I got it. Okay, that's the best way to get in the head. Okay. Um, I will speak as loud as I can. Uh, okay. If any of you are filming this and I sound like I'm screaming, use your data capacities to make me sound more normal. That's great. We argue today the case challenging the NDAA in the Court of Appeals. This is one of the elite courts in the United States, and the judges, I think, were really up to the court's reputation. They were very sharp in their questions on both sides. They really challenged the government to prove that this is, in fact, not a new law, but an old law that merely has been recodified. The government's position is that the NDAA is merely an old 10-year-old copy of the old AUMF, which is the authority Congress gave the government to go to war in Afghanistan. We've dissected this in our briefs, and Judge Forrest and the trial court clearly agreed that this law broadens any pre-existing power of the military to detain people in this country. In fact, since the 1860s, the Supreme Court has held that no American may be detained in the United States by the military. There is a constitutional barrier between the military and the civilian, whether they are a citizen or not. The NDAA breaches that barrier. It allows for the first time by law the military to incarcerate citizens in this country. The government was challenged by the court to say that to prove that this is an old law and is nothing new. The government could not do that. The AUMF plainly broadens any power of the government that previously existed. It is an attempt by the executive branch to take on vast detention authority, not akin to a democracy, but like most of the dictatorships we've had the misfortune to know over the last century. If this power is upheld and used, it means that Americans can be subject to military imprisonment if the government deems they go too far in supporting an unpopular cause tied to the Middle East or to terrorists. If someone raises money for Guantanamo inmates and sends that money to their lawyers to support their defenses, that could be substantial support of Al-Qaeda. If someone hosts a webcast and figures from terrorist groups or Al-Qaeda are invited, is that substantial support? This broad statute endangers basic speech. We've seen professors incarcerated in this country because of such actions. We've seen at least one journalist taken by the U.S. in Yemen. Mr. Al-Haj, who was later released after a long period of detention on this theory. Our client Chris Hedges was detained by the U.S. military long before this law was ever passed, because he left the press pool. Surely if this law now exists, such endangerment is going to be more common. The government says that independent journalism is not subject to this law. Well, we don't know what that means. It's not in the law that exception. And administrations change their view. In fact, uh, Judge Kaplan bluntly said to the government, don't administrations frequently change their policies? In fact, you know, one notable example actually relates to medical marijuana, where the Obama administration early on said it would not prosecute such cases, but close to the election changed its policy and began prosecuting medical marijuana providers in California. Well, that's not an issue here. It demonstrates that a statement by the government today is not a guarantee of rights. Rights are guaranteed by the Constitution. Rights are endangered when statutes usurp the Constitution. This case is about guaranteeing 
and we do not become a society dominated by the military. My colleague Paul Mayer will mention and discuss the letter from many generals addressing this statute. This case is about keeping that barrier absolutely clear between the military and the civilian jurisdiction. The framers of the Constitution were very clear to make certain of two things. One, that the military is always commanded by civilians. And two, that the military will never have authority over civilians. This law changes that long-standing rule. And it is a threat to the basic liberty of people in this country. <coughs> Do we think that concentration camps will arise from this? Of course not. But this is an erosion of basic principles of law. And it's our job as lawyers to stop that erosion before it grows further. There's an old saying, it fish rots from the head down. When you threaten the Constitution in its basic goals of liberty, the rest of that body politic will begin to decay. Today we felt that the court was very thorough, was very active. They questioned us equally, which is their job. We don't know how they will rule. We think they should rule in our favor. We think the balance of the argument lies with us. But it is not our job to predict. It's our job to make our arguments. Uh, my colleagues will also say this. I want to thank the people who've been involved in this case. Bob Jaffe, who's worked with us. David Reeves has worked with us, both dedicated attorneys. Uh, Tangerine Bowl and Alexa O'Brien and many others. We have paralegals who've been actively involved. Uh, Dan Ellsberg and, and Noam Chomsky and Chris Hedges and Alexa O'Brien and Tangerine Boland and Brigitte Anstatir lent their names to this case. Okay, Something many people would be afraid to do. I want to say one more thing. Carl Mayer and I launched the domestic surveillance class action six years ago. At that time, dozens of lawyers around the country joined with us. When we launched this case just a few months ago, throughout the great breadth of this land, only two other lawyers called us to join us. That was Bob Daff, Jaffe and David Reed. That demonstrates the chilling effect that a statute like this has. Six years ago, before such a law, dozens of lawyers called and joined. Today, only two. That demonstrates the fear people begin to take on in a democracy. Thank you very much. I'll call and call now. Well, if you have any, I'll let, let me have Carl speak, and then maybe you can throw questions to both of us. Then Chris Hedges will address What? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Tangerine. By my count, today is day 4,163 of U.S. involvement in war, with no end in sight. This seems to be a perpetual war against an undefined enemy, terror. Even though this terror has existed for a long time, we have put all the military might of the country at the disposal of ongoing war. Today's challenge in court to the latest attempt to pass laws that would subject Americans to the detention of, of the military is just one of many statutes that both the Bush and the Obama administration have uh, passed and then worked to target domestic people within the United States of America. That includes citizens, residents, etc. You have in the United States now warrantless wiretapping. You have for the first time last year the FAA authorized 106 drones flying over our skies. And now this, this law seeks to make it lawful for the military to detain not just U.S. citizens but any civilians within our borders which has been a, a principle, an article of faith in the United States law since at least ex parte Milligan, which is a, a, a Supreme Court case following the Civil War. So this is part of an effort to change the climate. We hope we will prevail in this litigation. The, the plaintiffs, uh, thankfully, and I can't say how honored I am to represent uh, Daniel Ellsberg, Chris Hedges, Tangerine Bolin, Kai Wargala, Alexa O'Brien, Alexa O'Brien, all of them together have worked to make this a very important, I think, challenge to the ever encroaching national security state. And together, the plaintiffs and the lawyers have, challenged, have, have determined that whatever the outcome today in court, we will pursue this if we don't prevail. If we do prevail, we will continue to ask the o Obama administration, which said that they would veto this provision to honor that pledge 
and to make sure that forever there will not be detention by the military of American citizens. So, so that, is what, that is what we intend to do in the future. We, we can't read how the, the court will decide today, but we will pledge to, to, uh, to fight on into the future. I'd be happy to take questions. There are many, many people, I think, who uh, want to talk some of the plaintiffs. I'll let Tangerine orchestrate it, and I think we'll probably do a question there. Yeah. Well, we can let me just note, Paul lawyer. corrected me. I omitted Kaiwagala when I noted on plaintiffs. She's a young German student, a master's degree student, who came in uh, to this country to testify especially despite the right. <laughs> Oh, and we, 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 I neglected, I neglected to, uh, I omitted, uh, Birgitta Janssen here. And Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. You got it. You got it. All right, now we have everyone. We covered everyone. <laughs> we covered the base. So, should we take questions? Yeah, let's take that again. Yeah. We represent, sure, sure. we represent Tangerine Boland, right here. Hello. A group called Revolution, uh, U.S. Day of Rage, an, inter an interest group. Kai Wagola. Birgitta Janssen here, a member of Parliament of Iceland. Noam Chomsky, Chris Hedges, and Dan Ellsberg. Anyone else? Alexa Bryant. Alexa Bryant. Alexa Bryant. Alexa Bryant. <laughs> Bryant. We got that. <laughs> but al also, we're very, uh, we're very honored as well to uh, have the participation of, of Cornell West and Naomi Wolf yes. and other uh, leading fighters for freedom in the United States in this effort. And I can't thank them enough for their their writing and their inspiration, and uh, in that case, it makes it a, a treasure to uh, to pursue a legal fight that uh, that sometimes can get uh, can get tedious when you're fighting the government of the United States. Let's uh, take a few questions for our attorneys, and then we'll continue with our lineup. We're here. Good question. So it was so crowded in the courtroom. Many of us. Please repeat the question. The question was, can we give insights as to what the proceedings were like because many people hmm. couldn't get inside the courtroom? Well, it's very hard to uh, to read the panel. Uh, I recall uh, during the first decision where we prevailed and, and obtained an injunction from Judge Forrest, uh, the, the plaintiffs took us aside afterwards and, and told us quite appropriately that they thought we could have made this thus and such argument. Because they are very, very forceful plaintiffs, and they should, they should admonish their lawyers for not doing thus and such. And they, they thought we wouldn't prevail, and we did. It's, in my experience, it's, it's, it's all, it's almost impossible to read a panel. There was tough questioning on both sides. Uh, I, I think, I think regardless of how this turns out, the panel see, that, that we have won because we have brushed back uh, the effort by the national security state to extend its reach into uh, our domestic politics and laws. And I think that's the case because the only hang-up that the judges seemed to have was they thought that the statute already exempted citizens and residents uh, from detention within the United States. If we do nothing else but make it clear that that is the case, we will have won. Although we will, uh, regardless of the, the, uh, the opinion, if uh, we do not prevail on everything, take it all the way up to the Supreme Court until we do prevail or have exhausted all of our revenue. I, I think that encapsulates it. The court was really concerned only about one section of the law, which said, well, existing law as the citizens of people in the U.S. is not effective. And that's the only concern the court seemed to have. Otherwise, they didn't seem to accept any part of the government's case at all. And we answered very bluntly, well, that exception says, for people detained in the U.S., existing law is not effective. And we answered the court and said, but it presumes they'll first be detained by the military, and that's what the Supreme Court has said is unconstitutional. Yes? If the challenge to this provision is successful, does that, what's uh, the effect it has on the entire NDA? The, the NDA, is a, the question was, if this challenge is successful, what is the effect on the whole NDAA? The NDA is a vast appropriation bill. This is one small provision. This law, this case only affects the question of detention of people by the military for substantially supporting these groups. The appropriations bill is not affected, and the part of the NDAA dealing with combatants remains untouched. And we don't challenge that. If you're a combatant, you're a combatant. You live with the law. Do we have a time yeah, frame idea when the judges might see the answer that? The question is what was, do we have a time frame for a decision? Uh, the answer is we don't. They agreed. At our instance, we hear it on an expedited basis. Uh, typically, these things take up uh, months rather than weeks. 
uh, unless the channel is, is uh, it has some sort of foregone conclusion in mind. I, I will note the court suggested in the argument we might want to wait until the Supreme Court rules on the case called Clapper, also featuring our good friend Chris Hedges as a plaintiff, which involves a question of whether journalists have standing to challenge the FISA wiretap law. So the court might actually wait until the Supreme Court rules on that decision, and that might not come down until June. So we may have quite a bit of time to wait. Uh, behind you, there's a question. And we're gonna... uh, yes, you, you have mentioned that um, the jo free, uh, freelance journalists, they won't fit into, uh, they will fall into the law, into the NDAA. Uh, but my question is, and then somebody, one of you also mentioned that if you are uh, on the borders, they will be able to apply the law to you. So how about Julian Assange, who is right now in London? How about that law will apply to him if he is moving into the other country? The, the, the question was, uh, are independent journalists uh, in, uh, encompassed encapsulated or captured under the law, number one, and number two, how would uh, how would the law relate to Julian Assange? You know, the, the answer is Julian Assange is being investigated for a violation of the Espionage Act because he took documents that were classified from a member of the military, Bradley Manning. He really doesn't fall directly under this law, but it's broad enough, it is broad enough that certainly the government probably could use this law to incarcerate Julian Assange. Yeah, does that also include somebody like the, map, the Icelandic member of parliament, Birgitta Jansdottir, who's supposed to come here in, in April and is fearful of former safety? Uh, Tangerine Bolin wishes to address that, but the answer to that is yes, it could apply to any such person. So, so, uh, you got to say would right my, right. Lawyer, my lawyer can correct me on this, and we have discussed it at great length. Um, there are two hypotheses on the rationale and, and MO behind what the government is doing here. Um, there are two hypotheses uh, regarding what the rationale and the MO of the government, you know, what the rationale is doing. Sorry, what the rationale is here. Um, the first one is that there's been a pattern of disingenuousness on the part of the Department of Justice. Um, from day one in this case, as far as it, 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 it appears that there's been a deliberate conflation of the powers of indefinite detention under the authorization for use of military force from 2001 which allowed George Bush and company to go after terrorists. It had a very narrow uh, three classes of people that the AUMF uh, applies to. It's uh, people who participated or planned the 9-11 attacks, members of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. That's it. Very, very narrow. Those are very firm parameters. Um, however, uh, the 2012 NDAA, the provision over which we're suing, added a paragraph, 1021B2. The government keeps claiming over and over again that the AUMF and NDAA are exactly the same, but 1021B2 does two things. It possibly retroactively legalizes the fact that they have been over broadly interpreting the AUMF for who knows how long, perhaps since 2001. It's a huge quagmire. Our case is potentially the latch on Pandora's box here. We threaten to expose the fact that possibly two administrations have been over broadly possibly illegally interpreting a law, the AUMF. It's really dangerous for them. So 1021b2 appears to me, at least in my investigation, to be a deliberate attempt to legalize previous activities and to, they keep saying affirm and codify the AUMF. You don't need to codify a law, it's a law. The second theory on this, though, is that 1021b2 is very carefully crafted to go after people like Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks. We don't know what's happening with the secret grand jury investigation. Obviously, none of us are privy to that information. It, but they haven't come forth with anything so far. The language of 1021b2 is so carefully written that perhaps it's written to apply to people like Julian without sending alarm bells ringing throughout mainstream media. It's a fine honed tool. And you can see that in the court arguments, the, the arguments over and over again. They're very careful with their words. If you're independent enough, you won't be in trouble. But they won't define independent. independent. Yeah, they won't define associated forces. So throughout our case, there's a deliberate conflation of these two laws. They would like you to believe that they've always had these powers of 1021b2. Patently false. So that's, I hope that answers your question about Julian Assange. Thank you. Uh, just the last point on that.
If we allow this door to open, this is a slippery slope. Whatever the government thinks, they may think, we're the good guys, we're only going after the bad guys, we'll never use these powers incorrectly. Well, I'm sorry, that's the us. And if they want to use these powers on Julian Assange and anyone else related to WikiLeaks, like Jacob Applebaum, who's here today, who will speak, uh, Birgitta Jan's daughter, etc., then that is a slippery slope that he can use to detain any of us. That's obviously what we're trying to stop. Yeah. So, uh, how many more questions can we take? Because there are people who need to speak. Let's, start, let's move on. Right, let, we, we have yeah. Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Ellsberg is here. Dan Ellsberg. Yeah. Well, I spent the other night reading a 112 page decision by Catherine B. Ford. And at the end of it, I had a feeling that I don't have every day of the week these days. I felt proud of being an American. That came to me overwhelmingly as I read her arguments. Here's a judge appointed by President Obama who is shamefully being confronted now with arguments in favor of a blatantly unconstitutional provision. And for once, for once, a judge is willing to say this is facially unconstitutional no matter to whom, to when, under what circumstances. Uh, I doubt if the circuit court judges I'll be very pleasantly surprised that they have the courage to do what she's done and uh, not simply read time servers for their own uh, advancement. I doubt if this rule will advance her very much. Something that affects me very strongly <laughs> is this. Someone who is able to see so clearly that 1021b2 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows you to put an American citizen in civilian in military custody, treated like Bradley Manning is in the Marine Barracks right now, indefinitely without charges. That's not a fight he had to make in 1776. George III didn't have that power. No King of England didn't have a power like that since John I. So here we have a president, a democratic president, who is wiping out uh, the Magna Carta as well as it is what seems to be very clear is the three senators who were uh, advising, who were arguing this, for the indefinite detention without charges of American citizens <laughs> against the Fifth Amendment, is well described as an enemy of the Constitution of the United States. And I'm afraid that is true of the President at this point, and going along with this, having encouraged it earlier. And if every, pres every senator who votes for that. And let me remind you, every one of them, the civilians, took the same oath that Bradley Manning took and that I took as a Marine. And that is not for a commander in chief. It is not, it is not mentioned. It is not to obey the regulations of the commander in chief. It is solely to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies and foreign and domestic. It was clear to me for years that we were governed by a handful of people, Bush, Cheney in particular, Addington, Rumsfeld, who were, in a technical sense, and I do not mean rhetorically, enemies of the United States Constitution. That does not mean I thought they were traitors, that they appeared to anybody else, or that they didn't feel loyal to the United States and patriotic. I'm sure they wanted the best. And they're absolutely entitled to say that they believe that the current rights in the Bill of Rights are inappropriate, especially in a world of terror, and that we no longer deserve or can afford freedom of speech or freedom of rights. And that's their right as Americans. It is not their right to say it or act on it as members of the Congress of the United States or people who have taken that oath to support the Constitution as it is. The fact is that the people representing that case now, that the Judge Forrest's excellent decision, that firm decision of the people who understand the spirit of this country, it absolutely is right. It deserves to be confirmed. Those who vote against it, I would say, are voting, in some cases, you'll have to say, deluded, very deluded. But where they understand that what they're doing, they are violating their oath. So what it comes down to is, we can't trust the leaders of this country to protect our rights any more than we can trust Goldman Sachs or Wall Street in general when they sell us 
security. Well, think of the other institutions I could go through at this point. <clears throat> it really is up to us if Bradley Manning gets what he says, namely discussion, information, debate, and reform, then he says we are not doomed as a species. That sounds grandiose, that sounds self-serving there. It is not. In the world of climate control, in the world of nuclear weapons, but in the world of civil liberties, where this administration, this term, is turning in once again to the fourth term of George W. Bush on that area, it basically is up to us, no one else. And thank God we have an ally like Judge Elizabeth Forrest, but we need to support her, point out that she is not just expressing an opinion, she's saying blatant truth. And it's up to her to congratulate her, back it up, and see that the Supreme Court sees her life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've undergone a corporate coup d'etat. Your name, Chris? My name is Chris Hedges. Case <laughs> <laughs> Hedges versus Obama. Can you spell that? Uh, he is the captain. <laughs> hey. We've undergone a corporate coup d'etat. There is no impediment left now to corporate power. And the corporate state understands that as the economy continues to deteriorate, as the effects of climate change, and we just bore the brunt of that with Hurricane Sandy, over $70 billion worth of damage kicks in. There will be inevitable blowback on a betrayed population. And what's happening in this court now is the last thin line of defense between protecting what is left of our anemic democracy and the imposition of a military state. Yeah, The deterioration of civil liberties under the Obama administration has complete continuity with the attack on civil liberties under the Bush administration. In fact, under the Obama administration, it has been worse. The radical interpretation of the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as giving the U.S. government, in particular the executive branch, the right to assassinate American citizens. And we just saw the white paper leaked by NBC, leaked to NBC on the drone attacks. The use of the Espionage Act, as Dan mentioned, to shut down all whistleblowers, any narrative that challenged the official government narrative, the FISA Amendment Act, which retroactively makes legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of tens of millions of American citizens, and we know that our personal information is being stored in supercomputers in, U in Utah, and now the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, overturning 200 years of domestic law to allow the military onto our streets to seize American citizens strip them of due process, put them in military facilities, including our offshore penal colonies, and hold them indefinitely. The corporate state knows what it's doing. If the Congress had put in one small sentence saying that U.S. citizens were exempt from this legislation, we would all pack up and go home. But they will not, because as Senator Graham pointed out, it is designed to detain U.S. citizens. And the bottom line is, as this unrest continues, the corporate state does not trust the police to protect them. It wants the ability to call in the military. This case is one of the most important cases in decades in the protection of our most basic and important constitutional rights. And the heroes of this case are standing next to me who have not earned a dime from this, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron. They're the ones who do the work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alexa O'Brien. Hi. How is everybody? Thank you for coming today. All right. I just prepared a short statement. When the U.S. government said in federal court that they wouldn't guarantee I wouldn't be indefinitely detained under Section 1021B2 for articles I had written on the war on terror, what was at stake was more than our national politics of charismatic luckiness, ambiguous scapegoats, and self-centered objectivity. 
only fools argue that laws concerning the life and liberty of human beings should read in the poetry of fortune cookies and be backed up with the legal precedent of Yale's speeches. Section 1021b2 was passed with bipartisan support, bought and paid for by lobbyists in one of this nation's most mistrusted congresses and signed into law by Ad Age Marketer of the Year with a signing statement as arbitrary and deceptive as the Justice Department's about face appeal and argument in this very case. Let's dispense with the myth that the ubiquitous application of extrajudicial power is the exception to an unchecked executive. And let's dispense with the myth that Congress has the constitutional power to legislate the military detention of civilians. Let's also dispense with the myth that the U.S. government hasn't already detained journalists under the AUMS seeking to gain intelligence on media organizations. Or the myth that the president hasn't played a personal role in the imprisonment of a journalist covering the U.S. war on terror in Yemen. I've covered the WikiLeaks release of JTF memoranda known as the Guantanamo Files and revolutions across the Middle East and North Africa. I've conducted hours of interviews with former Gitmo prison guards, detainees, defense lawyers, and human rights activists. For the last year, I've covered the U.S. investigation of WikiLeaks, and to date, I've published the only publicly available transcript for the secret prosecution of Bradley Manning taking place at Fort Meade. Because of my work as a journalist, government contractors attempted to falsely link a group which I helped found, whose only purpose is to support campaign finance reform in the United States to Al-Qaeda. They even published articles of their own, showcasing their ability to make Americans pay a hundred times more for the insecurity we could have had for free, stating the group that I helped found was infiltrated with Al-Qaeda and so-called cyber terrorists. Emails published by WikiLeaks indicated that other security contractors with ties to the U.S. government were specifically asked to connect this group to any Saudi or other fundamentalist Islamic organization. DHS published their unintelligence, declaring an error that the group that I helped found was linked to cyber terrorists. I am grateful to the individuals, including a fellow journalist who privately warned me that there were other unpublished government documents and that agents had their sight on me. I am grateful to the attorneys, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afrin, to the other plaintiffs, to Tangerine Bolin and to Chris Hedges for their generosity of spirit towards me and their good work. Section 1021 violates the First and Fifth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, our greatest protection against threats to our liberty and national security. This legislative spawn of our national ideology, the war on terror, also preys on the spirits of people because it offers us the illusion of an identity of dignity, of morality, making it easier for this nation and our people to part with them all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Closed. High crimes and misdemeanors directed committed by the U.S. government up to and including the White House. Secret surveillance, warrantless wiretapping, massive fraud, waste, and abuse, billions and billions of dollars being wasted of U.S. taxpayer money. What we see here is a Magnificent Seven standing in the breach against the final assault by this administration, which has been continuing from the previous administration since 2001, under the excuse that somehow we live in exigent conditions, and it's somehow because these conditions are so different and so extraordinary that the Constitution is just a mere piece of paper and it's not worth what it was written on. I emphatically disagree. Yeah. 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 It, is, it, is, it is the grand experiment launched over 220 years ago. It gives no government, no person, no agency or military to take away what are our rights, what are our liberties, what are our freedoms. They Let me just give you a small taste of what it's like to live under the national security state. In 2006, I came under direct investigation by the U.S. government. Why? 
because I was disclosing crimes being committed by the U.S. government against its own people in total violation of the Fourth Amendment. All done in secret, and all done in secret because the executive decided, you know what? We don't have to have an open and free democracy. We don't need transparency. We will determine in secret what's best for the American people, and we will keep them safe on our terms. In 2006, I came under investigation, and for the next five years, I faced the distinct possibility that I would spend many, many decades in prison. In fact, in 2008, the chief prosecutor said, Mr. Drake, how would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison unless you start cooperating with us? Yeah. In 2010, they prosecuted and then indicted me with 10 felony counts, five under the Espionage Act. You know what it means to be charged on the Espionage Act as an American? And all I did was stand up <laughs> to support and defend the Constitution. A Constitution that I had supported and defended by oh taking God. the oath four times in my government career. But no, espionage. I'm placed into the same category of people like Alger Hiss and Aldrich Ames. Why? Because I exercise my right under the Constitution to speak truth to power. And for that, they criminalize me. Yeah. Uh, this is what's at stake. If we don't stand here now, if we don't take the stand we need to take for all of us, all rights and all liberties and all freedoms, they will simply take them away. Amen. There's a thin line right now, a very thin line between what's left of the Constitution and the equivalent of martial law in this country, military rule. There's nothing less than that at stake. They know what they're doing. And the Constitution is the only thing that stands in their way. And if it's not us, then who? And if not now, when? Amen. It's time to take the stand. Yeah. We can yeah. stand. Yeah. This provision in the NDA remains in force. Otherwise, we'll simply see the force of secret military rule and executive fiat law prevail over the Constitution. And that is not, that is not a country I want to live in. Thomas Drake, National Security Agency whistleblower and a free American. Amen. Use it or lose it. The question is, didn't the senators who argued as Amici say the NDAA and the AUMF are the same? Well, that's what the government said. And the government argued, well, we've had the AUMF for 11 years, and we haven't arrested journalists in the U.S., so what's the big deal? The NDAA is merely the same. Well, it's not, because the AUMF, the Supreme Court said in the Hamdi case, applies to those who support hostile forces and who are engaged in armed conflict with the U.S. The NDAA drops off that second part of the Supreme Court's test. It allows people to be incarcerated only if they, if they substantially support these groups. It does not require that they be combatants. And that is the difference. The senators are wrong. We're quite sure, Carl Mayer can, can jump in on that too, we're quite sure the court is sensitive to that fact. The government had no cases to show an, a similar, an identity between these two laws. Well, let's just bear in mind that the two senators who were uh, desperate to argue today were Senators Graham and McCain. Right. So never forget what who the sponsors were of this legislation. Lindsey Graham, in sponsoring this legislation, said quite clearly, if you're a member of Al-Qaeda and you want a lawyer, we're going to tell you, shut up, you're not entitled to a lawyer. Therefore stating essentially that Lindsey Graham is deciding who's a terrorist, who's not a terrorist, right, right. and trying to take away the, exactly. the, the laws, the, the legal protections of the citizens of the United States. So uh, Lindsey Graham has been very clear about this, 
He called uh, Guantanamo detainees, for example, he called them uh, crazy bastards, even ones who never, who haven't been um, uh, uh, tried or uh, or charged. Uh, so this demonization of people and this assumption that uh, somehow these uh, extreme right-wing senators can dictate judicial policy in this country or judicial outcome is what we're fighting against. You know, I want to add a note, an anecdote. Uh, during the budget debate, you know, McCain and Graham kept coming up in all the coverage. And I said to Carl, why is it that these two guys are the only ones you ever hear quoted in the Senate? And Carl said, well, they're actually the only ones who do any work. But they happen to be wrong on this case. You know, their actions in the Senate subvert the rights of Americans. And whatever merits they might have in their lives, Senator McCain certainly has has an honored history. They're wrong in how they see the Constitution. Yes. No, the, the question was, is it unusual that the senators will do this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we put in papers opposing their ability to, to present the argument. Uh, it is unusual. It's been denied other times because there are many members of the Senate, and there's all sorts of questions about what the, the Senate uh, uh, stood for. They only stand for one position. And, in fact, the, the, the Senate voted to repeal this provision that we're fighting, and then it was stripped out of the conference committee by uh, Graham and McCain. So they've been uh, driving a lot of this debate. But, you know, frankly, I don't, I don't think that they added that much. And I don't think the, ju the judges thought that they added that much. Um, but, you know, the, 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 government, the government was good for some, some comedy, though, I must say. In their, in their, in their papers, they, they say that, that we ought to be, the journalists are protected under the uh, first protocol of the Geneva Convention. Funny thing is, the United States never ratified the first protocol of the Geneva Convention, so I don't feel very protected, and I don't think our clients do either. I hope this court sees through this. By the way, when the senators got to argue, they added five minutes to the government side. We got more time, so it didn't really bother us. Can I follow up on your question about the, uh, the, uh, the original Feinstein uh, bill, Feinstein being the Senate Corpus would not, it, nothing in the bill would be construed as habeas corpus or your constitutional rights being denied. How does that affect this provision in 1061-E? Well, the, the, the conference amendment. Right. Well, the, 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 the um, what, what was eventually added was a provision that allows for habeas corpus, and the, 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 the answer is, uh, is exactly what Judge Forrest held in her opinion. Habeas corpus is just a proceeding. Once someone's already detained, they can then move the government to, to, to clear them. Usually these cases take seven or eight years, so it's really, it's, it, you're still violating the constitutional rights of folks by uh, detaining them in the first place. So the conference committee, the, the language that was added doesn't solve the problem at all. Can I just get a, a synopsis of what the outcome of the case today, the hearing today was? Well, we, we argued the case both sides. It was, I think, you know, comprehensively argued. The court was mostly concerned with the question of, does Section E that says all existing law still remains in effect, even for a person detained in the U.S., does that mean that there's no real problem because if the law says you have to be released, there's really no harm, no foul? And we answered the court, well, that section of the law actually says that Americans in this country can be detained, but they can assert their rights to get out later. Yeah. But we don't have presumptions of detention in this country for speech-related activities. And I think we made the point quite clear to the court that this presumes something that the Supreme Court has always said is unconstitutional. The detention of Americans by the military, who civilians by the military. Uh, you know, and so I think that was where it comes down to. The court was very concerned with whether this is a saving of the statute. And I think we pointed out very bluntly to the court, it defines the evil of the statute by saying, if you are detained in this country, 
whatever rights you have still apply. And we made it clear to the court this presumes an illegal detention. That's probably where the case comes out in the end. Does that provision eliminate harm or is it simply a part of the harm? Could I just, um, in the last hearing, um, Catherine Forrest nearly held the government lawyer in contempt because he didn't know under which statute they were either holding people or not. I mean, so doesn't that kind of clearly show like the blurring of the lines on, on the part of the government? Well, you know, the, the government said in the case to the judge, Judge Forrest, we don't really know whether we're using the law because we don't keep track of what statutes yeah. we detain people right, under. Right. So the judge said, well, and you people may be in contempt. Yeah. She didn't hold them in contempt, yeah. but she said, if you don't know what statutes you're using and you're violating my preliminary order, you might be in contempt. Maybe Carl wants to address the contempt also. Right. No, well, the, I think Judge Forrest was just was just very forceful on that, that point that um, the government Hello. was playing uh, fast and loose with the facts. They refused to uh, keep track of how they were detaining people even though her injunction seemed to suggest that's exactly what they had to do. And the government kept shifting its positions. And throughout this uh, lawsuit, the government keeps shifting its positions. They, they initially said at trial that they, they couldn't guarantee that any of the plaintiffs wouldn't be subject to detention. They said that's flat out. And then they lost. They changed their position a little bit. They right. lost. They changed their position a little bit. And now now they're claiming, oh, you guys don't have to worry. Well, you know what? We'd like a federal court to Give me a them. break. Changing your story. So we're going to have to close up in a minute here. We have, um, I have one more person I'd like I, to come up. I wasn't expecting to say anything today. I just came out like the rest of the people yeah. that are here to support them in their case. I just came out today to support them in their case today like the rest of the Americans and other people who are here. And I, I guess the reason that she wished me to speak is because I have actually been detained by the U.S. government a number of times where they denied me access to a lawyer, where they told me that I would maybe never even get a trial, where they actually threaten. When they talk about these things in a sort of abstract sense here in this court, and they say it's only for enemies, well, they've actually called me a terrorist. I've had members of the U.S. Army detain me on U.S. soil. And actually, and I know that I'm not the only one. And, I, and if I had been a Muslim American in the last 10 years, I probably would have had it a lot worse for the last 10 years. But the point is that it's not an abstract thing. And what these people are fighting here today is one of the most important court cases that is happening in America right now. And what we see across the country is stuff that is even worse in some cases. Drone strikes, um, what happened to Anwar al-Waki and his 16-year-old son in Yemen. This is an expansion of authoritarianism across the entire spectrum. Whether it's the case that Birgitta Yonstad, Rob Gongrip and I have recently lost in the Fourth Circuit about the government needing to get warrants to get data, whatever it is. Across the board, you see this expansion of authoritarianism. And these people, their court case is so important. So you should tell your family members and your friends, really, to support them in any way that you possibly can, but also to understand that this will affect everyone if it is as bad as it seems to be. And I think it is that bad, if not worse. <laughs> and just imagine what happens when we have this, and it is absolutely unambiguous. Combined with the drone strikes, combi combined with the warrantless wiretapping, the lack of actual due process, where they pretend that due process is any process they make up instead of judicial process. Woo! This is really scary shit. This is really, really scary. Yeah, yeah. And as someone who has been detained by some of these people, let me tell you, it does not get less scary. So please support them. Hitting Thank you for coming to this. Yeah. 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 That's actually a perfect segue to my final comment. And we wouldn't be here today if we hadn't created something kind of unique and unorthodox. And it's really important uh, to uh, communicate that to you guys. I had hoped to uh, do something different in that I combined a lawsuit with a campaign. And this campaign is worldwide. We have people all over the world, tens of thousands perhaps more, who support us. We've been working together in, the, in these conflicting imperatives. I mean, I've had to learn a lot about the law in the last year, and it's been a little messy. I'm exhausted, sorry. Um, but but uh, together, we, we raised money to cover the cost of this case. We have live streamers here that we've, we've met along the way. People have helped us on every front. And you know, when we're facing so many compromised, broken, toxic systems, when our voices are not being heard, and there's no chance for our voices to be heard because the only voices that, that are being heard are moneyed voices, corporate voices. We, we have lost our representative democracy. It no longer exists. 
together we have to get it back and we have to be creative about that we have to be nimble and flexible and fast on our feet but we really have to work together Amen. and the last thing i want to say about that is i feel really honored to be part of this evolving tribe and i want to actually say a trip or pay tribute to aaron Schwartz, whom we lost a few weeks ago as you all know yeah. aaron Schwartz linked me to demand progress david siegel is here today demand progress is our partner in the case and has carried us from day one we wouldn't be here without aaron Schwartz. So we're all part of this evolving tribe. Jacob Applebaum, WikiLeaks, the team.